Okay, welcome to the transportation seminar at Portland State University. My name is Leming Wang. Since Dr. Gallup and Dr. Uni Krishna are both out of town today, so I'm hosting the seminar on their behalf. So for today, we are very pleased to have Professor or Dr. Ann Dunning with us. Uh, Dr. Ann Dunning is associate professor at the in the Department of Planning at University of Kansas. And for today, she will talk about transportation planning uh, for recreational areas. With that, I will give the floor to Dr. Dunning. Thank you very much. Uh, I, you are aware of the topic. We're talking about recreational areas today. I, uh, let me state outright, I do not mind being interrupted. If you have a question, I'd rather you not spend the next half hour thinking about that question instead of, uh, instead of uh, being able to keep, keep going, keep with us. So um, go ahead and uh, if, if something sounds confusing or if you, something sounds wrong, just be nice about it and, uh, and let, let me know. So recreational areas. What we're, uh, first of all, uh, I was asked to give a little bit of, a, of, of an introduction to, uh, of who I am. I am very open to giving a more personal introduction. Right now, I'm going to keep it stuck to, uh, to recreational area stuff. I'm willing to talk life decisions and all that uh, after the presentation if you want to know about um, how to get a, a particular career path. But my formative experiences in this area, I started off as the uh, first transportation scholar of the National Park Foundation. The, they realized in the 90s they realized in the National Park Service that they had terrible transportation problems and they had no transport, literally no transportation expertise in the National Park Service. Uh, they did work with the Federal Highway Administration for infrastructure, but, uh, but that doesn't do travel demand management. So they decided the best way to start is to start with the students and so they, uh, they developed this transportation scholar program. I am very sorry to say that they actually killed it a year or two ago. Um, so it is not an opportunity that's available for you, but it, it was something that, uh, that, that actually helped a lot of parks and helped a lot of, uh, a lot of students for a while. After I was involved at Glacier National Park working on an environmental impact statement for the rehabilitation of the historic Going to the Sun Road, I, um, Glacier asked me to represent it at the National Park Service's uh, Alternative Vehicle Design Workshop. Because, and by the way, let's talk terminology. The Park Service talks about alternative transportation. I hate this term. Because if it's the alternative, it's not the norm. It's public transit, and it really can be the norm in some of these places. So uh, they, they do use that as the alternative transportation, and they were developing alternative vehicle designs, which meant buses. Um, and, then, uh, and then my dissertation, the National Park Service, the National Park Foundation, with funding from Ford Motor Company, actually uh, provided funding that I had the worst dissertation project in the world where I had to visit seven national parks for a week or so each, and they paid me to do that. And, <laughs> and I had to go, actually, believe me, when, when Hawaii fell out of the, when Volcanoes National Park fell out, I was really bummed about that one, but it fell out of the criteria. But I did end up visiting, uh, on that dissertation, I visited Acadia National Park in Maine, Cape Cod National Seashore in Massachusetts, Hot Springs National Park in Arkansas, um, in Utah, Bryce Canyon National Park, in Zion National Park, uh, in California, Yosemite National Park, and uh, in Alaska, Denali National Park and Preserve. So that, uh, and, and, and I will speak from what I found, it, it was a long time ago, but that was such an opportunity to gain primary data and to gain uh, firsthand exposure that I still very much uh, hearken to some of the lessons learned through that. Uh, these, are, these experiences really formed and, and, and set me up into this. Uh, I've had these publications. I went ahead and set up hot links for these. Now, uh, these latter two are pay publications, so these are simply links to where you can buy them. But if you're visit, viewing this, uh, this presentation on the web, um, you are, you, I, I set this up so that you can e easily link into them. By the way, the dissertation is 765 pages, but there's some very good case studies in that. So that's who I am. What we're doing today is talking specifically about what are the unique qualities of recreational areas. I was once in, a, in a, uh, a van full of state Department of Transportation planners from various states, and I commented on the recreational areas, and they said, 
What's the big deal? I mean, what's it's you, transportation planning? There is a process. We know what this process is. Yes, and you apply that process, but you apply it differently, or at least with different expectations and with different considerations to what you're going to emphasize. Uh, we will talk about what are those characteristics that you need to consider, and uh, and then go through some planning process ideas for recreational transportation. And I'm going to end this presentation with a strong admonition for the incredible importance of communication. Communication across transportation planning, and, and just definitely transportation engineering, communication, buy-in with the public is, ab is, is underfunded, absolutely does not receive the time and attention it needs and strategy. Um, but when you get into these recreational areas, people care about them. People really care about their, their, their resources, their local resources, or their national resources. And you need to have this kind of communication. So we are talking about places that might be natural. They might be the Columbia River Gorge. They might be activity-oriented, the entire city of Las Vegas, Disney World, Dollywood, um, uh, or simply the, uh, the Enchanted Forest here. Uh, and they, or they might be historical or cultural. They have value in, in different ways, and, and the people will interact with them differently, but there still are going to be places that people are visiting in their leisure time. Your recreational community, most of what we're talking about, even though there's a lot to, uh, uh, that you can do to, for your recreational opportunities in Portland, we don't think of Portland as a recreational community because it has a diverse economic base. You have many different activities. If tourism tanks one given year, yes, you'll feel it, but it won't kill the city. There was one community, and Bryce Canyon National Park is in a county where 95% of the, of the land in the county is, owned by, is publicly owned. And the only way to get revenue in the county is through tourism. And if you have a bad economy and nobody's traveling, it's a real problem. So we're, we're talking about places that are far more dependent on tourism. Uh, um, and then if the, if the community is so affected by tourism, you really, uh, it's, it's almost gonna, inherently going to have to be a smaller community because a, a big community is going to end up being diversified. You end up with polarized incomes. These places are beautiful. And the wealthy like to live in beautiful places. So they will have their permanent residence. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that many of you have talked in your classes about the problem of people encroaching on the natural environment and the fact that we have wildfires and, and we're losing so much uh, human dollar value infrastructure because people are going out there. Well, that's what this is. Um, you also have the other end of the economic spectrum where you have minimum wage workers. Those seasonal folks who are working for, uh, will work for housing. Just let me live in this area and, uh, and spend the summer. Seasonal activity, seasonal. So uh, because of that, your permanent population might be very, very small, and your tax base is very, very small, which means you have a serious problem of scale. You have the ability to create a transportation system uh, that, is, uh, um, that is tremendously, uh, um, we'll get into the numbers in just a moment. All right, so this is the issue. Why in these environments do we need to plan transportation? Well, if you have rural road traffic that is mimicking metropolitan traffic, I know, slap a traffic light in there. Uh, in a rural area where there's cultural context, it doesn't fit. Uh, and actually, we, we spent this morning out on, in, uh, in the Columbia River Gorge trying to look at, well, how do you keep people from getting killed walking across the street if, uh, if there's all this traffic coming in? You also have these resources, and if I say the resource, that's what I mean. It's either natural or it's cultural, but it's something that is cherished or has tremendous value, and you want to protect it despite the number of people who are coming in. You have the issues of, the typical issues of air and noise pollution from vehicles. The noise pollution might be even more. In, uh, in Yellowstone National Park, uh, in the winter, snowmobiles have been, have been a contentious issue because people love to ride snowmobiles. Um, and uh, at one point they did a study and found that there, you could not ever be in the winter around Old Faithful, a beloved, cherished uh, uh, natural feature, without hearing 
mosquito buzzing in the back because of all the snowmobiles. So noise pollution in these areas can be much more of a problem than in downtown Portland. Um, if you have so much congestion that you're actually diminishing the tourism appeal, then you have that old joke that uh, that place is so crowded nobody goes there anymore. And you end up saying, well, how do we, how do we grow our tourism industry if, if, it's, uh, if it's an unhappy place to be? So what are the characteristics? Those are the places. What is the travel like? You have recreational travelers who are a mix of those rural permanent residents who are typically wealthy, those, uh, those lower income seasonal workers, or I should say low income, and commonly metropolitan visitors. By the way, the demographics of folks who visit national parks, very much upper middle income, highly educated white folk. Um, definitely some, some foreign tourists, but um, there's, that's a, that, to me, that's a little bit of a something to consider is while you're protecting these resources, you are also, uh, you have an equity uh, consideration there. Typically, the majority of the people don't know how to get around. Can you even imagine what that would be like during a peak period wherever you live? I mean, you, 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 especially a place like Portland, I was driving around with somebody last night, and, uh, and the congestion was so bad, you just go to the next street in the grid. But if you don't know the area well enough to know that you can connect that way, all you do is take whatever you can figure out. So 50% of the folks looking for an address um, or, or uh, t not necessarily taking a, uh, an, a, an efficient route, they expect vacation quality service. This is, I'm on vacation. I don't want to sit in traffic. Do you think they're going to go back again next year if they, or, or that they're going to tell their friends to go back again next year if they had a miserable time? No, it has to be wonderful. Fascination with spectacles. When Zion National Park was on the verge of putting in their transit system, they were going to restrict, as in not allow private vehicles in the park because they had 2,000 cars a day vying for 500 parking spaces, which means kids running across the road who are out of the vehicles while people are driving through the canyon saying, oh, wow, and that kid is right in front of the vehicle. The safety hazards of that are, were, were just terrible. So uh, you have distracted folks, even without a smartphone. Unusual peak activity. Depending on the resource, it might be if it's a ski lodge, you have winter activity. If it's uh, a lot of the national parks, uh, you have a lot of summer activity. And that, you know, we're used to the, the in, in the cities, you have the school buses on, start on the road in the fall and traffic gets worse. This is the exact opposite, which means you need to plan about it differently. Uh, weekends, meal times, the, the, the peaking can be very much different. These were four of the parks that I visited. I updated it with 2013 data. And you can see here... They have this seasonal peaking in the summer. Each and every one of them does. But here we have Alaska, and it has a tremendously steep peak from when the snow melts to when the snow starts falling in September. You have uh, Acadia in Maine is, is somewhat similar, but a little bit later. And then you have the other extremes. Here is Zion, the desert. And, yeah, they're not as excited. Okay, yes, the vacation time's in July. A lot of people will go, but if they can make it earlier or later, they will because it's the desert. Daily. When, uh, when I was working on the environmental impact statement in Glacier National Park, I, uh, they were at the point, the thing, actually, the, the uh, consultant was past due on it. And so it was in a, a rush that they were trying to get, get the, uh, the visitor experience component of the, um, uh, the environmental impact statement done. And I went in there in June, and, uh, and it was already overdue, I think, um, but it was uh, absolute drop-dead deadline in, uh, uh, at a citizens advisory meeting in September. So I show up, and I'm like, okay, well, where, where are the traffic counts? We're trying to rehabilitate a road. Where are the traffic counts? And the only traffic counts that had been taken were at the entrance gates to the park, which meant that the road itself, which would take you two hours to drive, maybe two and a half, I forget, um, they, they had no idea what the traffic was like in the medium point. So I, I, I uh, arranged to get some traffic counters and spent um, a month uh, nailing traffic counters into the road and ended up coming up with data that said this. 
And when I showed the when I showed the um, uh, the roads guy, the main guy uh, in charge of roads there, this uh, this information, his jaw kind of dropped. And he said, I've never seen data like that in the National Park Service. I have always run the mowers for the road in the afternoon when traffic is not there. But you just told me that there's no traffic at 7 a.m. because vacation people like to sleep in. And so he ended up changing all of his operations just by simply having the data. And we expect in, most, uh, in, in metropolitan situations, we expect our bimodal peak with a morning peak and an afternoon peak. That is not here. That is not here at all. When uh, Zion National Park did restrict private vehicles and everybody needed to be on the transit service, the businesses in town had to adapt because they found that people were coming back. They were spending the whole day in town. And they would come back. And they now needed to keep their restaurants open until 11 o'clock at night because dinner time had moved because of the transportation. Another characteristic of recreational transportation, we have atypical destinations, even to the point that somebody said, hey, let's create a slogan to say destination cruise ship. The re there's a very sound reason for that. The cruise ship, you know, Titanic, how, you want to cross, how are you going to get across the ocean? The boat is the only way to go. Okay, that was true for a long time. And then planes came around, and then, uh, and then we also had uh, planes getting democratized by the, um, or plane travel democratized by the Deregulation Act in 1978. So there was no reason for anyone to get on a boat for any kind of distance. Yes, water ferries continued, uh, or, you know, with commute ferries. Um, but we, we didn't really have a reason to, have, to go long distance, and so that's when they said, you know what, I bet, I bet we should put a swimming pool on a boat. <laughs> and we make the destination, not that the boat will get you somewhere, but that the transportation mode is the destination. The cruise is where you're trying to get. And by the way, we'll stop off at some ports. We have another form where the transportation is the point. Leaf watching, driving, and just looking at the beautiful leaves. We have, uh, okay, no, I, I, we're going to go. We're going to go to see the Columbia River Gorge. What do you mean? I mean we're going to park occasionally, walk 500 feet, and then get scared and, and jump back in our cars. We're not going to spend so much time there or certainly not, not get that far away. So we might be destined for another mode. Who has riven, uh, rafted or canoed down a river? You? Oh, lots of folks. Okay. Um, how do you do it? Okay. Okay, so you go to the store, they drive you up, they drive back down, you float down, and then you you end up with multiple trips just for this one destination that is a trip itself. And uh, and actually one of the one of the transportation scholars that uh, went to Buffalo River National uh, something park I don't know if it's a park or not. Uh, but uh, he, his job was there basically to handle this this situation, if you want to plan transportation for this, your best situation would be to think in terms of having some sort of shuttle service so that people are not doing the typical of drive a vehicle, park it at the end, drive another vehicle, and go up to the beginning, and then when they'll come back, they drive this. So you're, st you're filling in for these multiple parking spots, multiple vehicles, and, and all the environmental issues associated. Uh, I one time did a travel diary study, and I could tell that somebody had with great glee filled out a page and said, well, at uh, 10 o'clock, went to the airport. At 10.15, entered plane. At 10.21, jumped out of plane. At 10.22, <laughs> walked back to the airport. Um, so parachute would be another one. Informal parking. Well, we don't deal with this. So I mean, we deal with illegal parking in downtowns. But there are different issues here. This is ecological. This is, uh, I mean, certainly you have, to, you, you have other considerations for denting and, and safety. Uh, if, is, if you have a natural resource that you're trying to protect, if there's a, an endangered species somewhere on the property and people are parking like this, which they, boy, you, you, you go to a trailhead and here's the parking lot, but there's this one place where I think I can squeeze, people will squeeze there. So we have these travel characteristics. We try to manage them. And here is an example of what Mount Hood um, ended up saying. And uh, you have here 
coordinating transit and travel demand management. You have intelligent transportation systems. Increasing and extending public transit, increasing and extending private transit, which they say is a medium or low priority. Uh, I find that interesting because the only one here that basically will cost the public nothing, they're saying is a medium or low priority. Why? Why, if it's the least expensive, why would you why would you put that as low priority? Um, it, 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 so his answer was because it's what the government is doing, and and that's akin to it, because you don't have any. Oh yeah, good. Doing anything if you're interesting perception. I wouldn't have thought of that, but that's, that's a good point. That's a really good point. Um, yeah, it, it might be a perception. It might be simply um, we can't. We need this, and we don't know. We we don't know what time frame they're going to work on. If it's going to come when we need it, we don't know how they're going to do it. So there are a lot of unknowns. The solution. What's the solution? Communication. Talk to them. It might well be that you have somebody who would like to do something that's very, very close to exactly what you're thinking. But you, um, uh, uh, if you talk to them and say, well, this is why we were thinking about doing it just a little bit differently, they might say, that works. Or they might say, there's no profit there. Let's, uh, um, we, we really can't do it that way. In that case, OK, public transit, great. But at the tremendous expense of subsidy that public transit comes with. Uh, let's see, advertising and improving carpooling information sites. Decide, so carpooling has been forever a, dare I say on the web, a somewhat miserable option because it involves advanced planning, because it involves um, unknown human relationships. The person might smoke, the person might wear too much perfume or not bathe, the person might talk all the time, that you, you might just need all the things. You, you end up with this long-term relationship with somebody you're commuting, with, you're carpooling with every day. Uber has really changed that. People are willing to ride share on this. Okay, you, you, might, you might take the same Uber later on because it worked, but you can also not take it the next time. So uh, Uber has really changed things. Uh, seeing this, if I were thinking of the way carpooling has been forever and ever, I would say I, I wouldn't even I would not consider that a high priority because I don't think it's going to work. Now that we have a different world of ride sharing, that one might really work. Uh, creating a one-stop traveler web page, all of the information, as in communication, coming together in one place so people know where to go. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, and increasing cell phone coverage on the mountain. Again, that's a matter of communication, information, getting that out there. So they're looking here with their travel demand management. They want ITS, information, communication, communication. These are the ways to put the, uh, put the information, or to, to, well, basically, to get the public aware of what the good opportunities are to try to help things happen. Uh, that, and then otherwise, they're talking about things like public transit, intelligent transportation, things that are going to have a very high uh, cost to, to implement or to keep on going. Um, and all right, there's no one solution. As with everything in transportation, it is, uh, there's no panacea, and you need to have a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and different people will respond to different things. How do we provide service? Well, the National Park Service, uh, I have a few slides directly from them in here. Uh, they, uh, they outright said, okay, well, let's look at our different, uh, different modes and consider what we are maintaining. Now, this is specifically related to, uh, to asset management. They looked at, okay, what about transit in parks? Well, people think that the quintessential American vacation is putting the kids in the SUV and going and driving around. In fact, we had transit in parks back in the 30s, before the rise of the, the, the rise of the automobile and highway era. And so we have this precedent. These vehicles were still on the road in the 1990s. They realized that they were really not in good shape. They took them off the road. Ford Motor Company decided that was a terrible um, travesty. So they re, re, uh, revent, renovated them and put them in with dual fuel propane. And so we could have that. But uh, this, these were the buses for Glacier National Park. They were red. 
at the time, they, act, and they were built by the White Bus Company. So the White Bus Company, they put the red buses in Glacier. They put the yellow buses in, in uh, Yellowstone. They put, uh, I think, green down in Yosemite. There were a number of parks that had these. Glacier was the only one that continued to have the fleet. And taking that fleet as inspiration, the National Park Service put together their alternative uh, transportation vehicle design workshop and brought together folks who were familiar with parks from across the nation to ask what do we need to consider with, uh, when we were thinking about trying to create a new vehicle. And the, uh, the end of the charrette, after a few days, came out with these, this, kind of, uh, this kind of guidance for how to move forward. What we need to consider is what is the true purpose of the transit. Purpose of transit is a very, very difficult thing. If I'm talking, when I'm teaching my public transit class, I'll, I'll say what I learned from Charlotte Area Transit. One day I, I, asked the, um, I asked the top executives of Charlotte Area Transit if they could please talk with my students. And I said, the point of this exercise is for them to get as creative as they possibly can. So what I want you to do is not give them the problems you're working on, but give them the problems that you are not working on because it is so intractable, there's no way you can solve it. And I was just shocked that we walked in and I said, okay, so I told you what we're doing here. Can you please just tell us our problems? And right away, one of the executives of Charlotte Transit said, yeah, can you tell us what we're doing, what the purpose is, what our objectives are? And she was talking about the metropolitan model of we either are serving transit dependent or choice riders. We're either presenting um, gold-plated service to attract people or the most basic uh, the, uh, possible, the most bare bones possible to serve as many people as possible. So you have that issue. Transit for national parks, is it to move people, to address congestion? Is it to protect the resource? Well, if you're protecting the resource and you're now channeling everyone into the same stops, are you protecting the resource? Or would it be better if you spread it out and just let people drive to different places? Because you will end up with a lot more wear and tear at the specific places where you stop. So you need to consider wherever you are, whatever your park is, what is the true purpose of the transit. You need to consider what location you have in terms of the terrain. I, 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 got, a, I got my slice of humble pie at that workshop. Because I'd been, I'd been at Glacier for half a year, and I knew transportation, and I walked in and said, well, obviously, what we need are lots and lots of windows and, and uh, you know, open-top places, because everybody wants to experience their resources. And the um, Florida people scoffed. <laughs> you do not want open tops in Florida when the sun is beating down on you and everybody is coming into your transit sub sunburned. So you need to consider what you really are dealing with. Do you need a lot of propulsion because you're going up and down mountains? Do you have a very flat terrain? Are you, are you dealing with uh, uh, what kind of um, uh, surface material you're dealing with? What does a driver need in this case? How long will the driver... <sighs> How long will the, will the passengers be in there? Uh, at Yosemite National Park, passengers uh, were, well, the, the, the buses were driving through the mountains. So they put out a rule saying, you are not allowed to ride if you, are, uh, if, there's, if you don't have a seat. If the demand is greater than the seating capacity, you're not on there. Well, in most situations that are flat, if you tell people you can either, uh, you can either wait here for another hour or whatever it is to the next bus, or you can stand, most people will stand. So your, your park, again, is going to determine how your service will operate. Park service object or park resource objectives. I'll throw that one in with your purpose of transit is, should be very much in, in, uh, uh, in accordance with that. Vehicle procurement requirements. What's your bureaucracy and how will it work? Um, I very much choose to put that last uh, because it should not drive things. Uh, it frequently does. All right, what about design elements? Well, you need to be thinking about basic physical components like the dynamics of the vehicle, the, what's the interior going to look like, the exterior, um, uh, is, uh, what kind of wheelchair accessibility. We definitely need that. Um, HVAC got a fond uh, top priority in this conference because Zion had learned. They took the resource objective was peace and quiet in the canyon, in Zion Canyon, so that you can hear every bit of wildlife and you have a peaceful experience. And so they said, 
well, clearly we want these buses to be as quiet as possible so they are not intrusive. Uh, and that meant no air conditioning in the desert, in the summer, when you're hanging on the bus <laughs> next to the person next to you. And that did not go over well. So, so Zion retrofitted its buses so that they would have air conditioning because it was the desert in the summer. So uh, HVAC, what, what are your needs there? Actually, uh, the, uh, an opposite example, Glacier National Park, those original buses that still operate do not have heat. And they send those buses up every day with wool blankets. And the, the, the passengers just, just huddle under the, and, and they pay top dollar for it. They love that experience because it is, it is so, um, so, tr so traditional and true. Fair collection. Fair collection is a thing. If you're going to operate transit, you need to know how you're handling that because if you're going to be handling cash, you have security issues. Uh, you have, how do you ha offer change? Is it a smartphone situation? It is, it is an entire study and an entire devotion to putting in transit service to consider how fares are going to work. So it might be cheaper not to collect fares. It might be cheaper to collect fares but not have it associated with the ride. It's part of the cost of going into the, into the area. You have to figure that out. Um, system requirements, security, safety. I had a, uh, so when I was doing my, my park visits, I, if the, I was doing it in the shoulder seasons because no, I was going to have time for a student when, I, when they were in the peak season. I went in the shoulder seasons, and if the transit system was still operational in the shoulder season, I rode it. And I was on the bus with the, uh, uh, in Cape Cod National Seashore, and there was a young female driver. I want to say she was probably 19. And I was riding the route back and forth with her. And the first time, we got to the far end of the route away from town. And she said, this is my least favorite part of the route. This is where I have to sit in this area that is wooded everywhere. This is the end of my route. And it, it, there are no street lights. And she, a 19-year-old girl, needed to sit with the door open and wait 10 minutes until it was time for the route to start again. And I don't think she had a panic button either. And it was a little bit earlier than, than everybody has cell phone days. So you need to think about security. You need to think about safety. Buses in general are wonderful for safety. You have one very well-trained driver uh, who, who has to go through ongoing, uh, ongoing uh, education and testing. Um, but at the same time, if there's visibility issues, you, you need to consider that and, and desi design accordingly. Signing and communication, I will get on that a lot. And then intelligent transportation systems, I will talk about that definitely. Put it all together, you end up with a bus designed by a committee. Does that look realistic? I was actually very, very shocked that they made it happen. I was very impressed. So, um, yeah, what, what, uh, what I, this bus designed by a committee. This aspect, I knew the, uh, the, the sorry, web people. This aspect I had high doubts for. I knew somebody who was a very, very big proponent of having a trailer. Like, just build the vehicle big enough to handle what you need. Come on. Well, Acadia taught me differently. Acadia National Park is, has incredible backcountry roads with bridges that, uh, masonry bridges that the Rockefellers built. And every bridge is different, is, uh, has a different design. And the, one of the major activities of Acadia is to bike on these backcountry roads. And somehow everybody uh, got the silent mental memo that the thing to do is to bike around and then at 5 o'clock in the evening go to the central visitor center and, and then decide you're tired and that you want to go home. And we've been advertising that the buses have bike racks. Most buses might have two bike racks. And if you suddenly have 50 bikes show up, that's not a good thing. And that is when this is ideal. When you say, okay, most of the day we need this bus for the people. But at 5 o'clock, we're going to send it with a trailer, and they're going to stick all the bikes on there. And we will manage to accommodate the visitor needs. So tangible form, this is the, uh, the yellow bus uh, and snow coach version for Yellowstone. Planning for recreational transportation. Here you see a bear. 
I learned when I was at Glacier the term bear jam as, a as opposed to traffic jam. It is real. And there are goat jams as well and ram jams. But uh, <laughs> when there is wildlife, these are not people who are trying to get to their commute. This is why they are here. And they will stop on the road, and your traffic is not going to move. Even though the bear is just kind of sitting there munching, they're going to stay and, 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 uh, and, and take a picture of it and such. All right, so for planning, this comes from the National Park Service. They were developing a long-range transportation planning process. I, I was contributing uh, as a subcontractor on it uh, a few years ago. I have not seen how this, uh, how, how this has manifested in the end because it, it's not on the web. But uh, they, they set up and said, well, we have these four areas. We have environmental stewardship, visitor experience, asset management, and ongoing activities. And we want to use this framework of visions, goals, objectives, condition, and performance assessment, needs identification uh, strategies. They wanted to create – now, National Park Service is in a um, – well, if you're working with National Park Service, you're in the same situation. But if it, to me, they're in a very different situation. They are the big dog of recreational planning. And they have a lot of things that, that come very top down. Uh, and there's a reason. There's, it's, just, it's just a big system. I ended up developing for my dissertation, oh, I'm sorry, and this one also, Pikes Peak, um, talking about performance measures. They come up with this acronym for SMART. It's a reasonable acronym, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. Uh, you may have been studying in your classes the difference between a goal and an objective, and a goal, a goal is pie in the sky, motherhood, apple pie, wonderful things. We want quality of life. An objective is we will reduce travel time by 10 minutes within three years. So it's an achievable, measurable, check mark kind of thing. That's what performance measures are. Um, so the National Park Service had that very top-down approach. I looked at, well, you have a lot of players. You have a lot of grassroots things coming in. You have a lot of stakeholders that make policies, and these policies are going to affect whatever it is you're doing in your recreational area. You must come together with all of these stakeholders and say, what is your parking policy? Geez, that's not – actually, we were talking this morning on the, uh, with the, um, um, in, the, in the gorge. There is one parking lot that is owned by the state DOT. There is one that is owned by – Oh, by the railroad, by somebody else. Okay. <laughs> um, so, and these parking lots are right next to each other. And I was strongly encouraging, you might want to make sure that you don't change your policy on this lot without talking to them first so you give a consistent message to the public. You have to be interacting with all these different folks. Um, ultimately, I came up with this transit planning process that I, that I recommend for recreational areas, to breaking it out. The top part is identifying partners and stakeholders. Number one. Park Service started off with identify your vision. But if you identify your vision, your objectives, your goals, and then bring people in, that's not good because they have different ideas. So start by bringing people together. And then you start saying, okay, well, we have these folks, and these are the main players. How are we going to engage everybody else? Then you gather your planning resources, figure out what you can do. Now we can start thinking about the planning. And I throw together defining goals at the same time anticipate externalities. In planning, we are terrible at claiming, oh, that was an unanticipated consequence. You could have anticipated it. It was a negative consequence. You might have been able to mitigate it if you started talking about it early. So go ahead and say, what are the externalities? There's a trade-off. If people are aware of it ahead of time, even if it is negative, they may say, oh, you did that knowing that was coming. I understand why, because we're getting this out of it. So you set up your goals. You figure out what measures will track progress to the goals. You figure out ex externalities. You figure out what measures will monitor those externalities. Then design a communication program. Usually an afterthought. I really recommend doing that early. How are you going to get the information out? Design the performance monitoring program. We've identified the measures. Now how and when and, and what will you do to, to get the data? All right, once you've defined it, again, you establish your vision. Now bring in the resources. Don't say we have so many resources, what can we do with them? Start with we want to do this. And then say, okay, we can only do two-thirds of it. But you know what? Acadia National Park, 
we want to do a transit system, and L.L. Bean really cares, and they will de donate $2 million to our Art Island Explorer system. That's a resource we didn't consider. If they had started anticipating negative $2 million, they would have had a lesser system. Start with your vision, then bring in the constraints, and consider if there are ways to get around those constraints. Then, after you've done all this, you've figured out your goals, your externalities, you know how you're going to communicate things, you know how you're going to monitor things, start your monitoring. Get the baseline. Get the baseline. You can never say what the impact is unless you first know what it had been. Then you review the design and context of the baseline. Final part of this, implement. Make it happen. And then you test and implement performance monitoring. You integrate the results. You re review and update the program. And then you go back and look at it all over again. Communication. Last thing I want to leave you with. So here, this, this whiteboard was something I ran into at Yosemite National Park. And it's saying the bug says take yarts. The bug. What bug? This youth hostel. The youth hostel is telling you that taking the bus is a good idea. That is a critical thing. When Zion National Park put in its transit system, it put in, so the, the, the visitor's gate is right here where orange and yellow come together. And in the canyon, they said no private vehicles. You must ride the bus if you want to go any, well, you can bike or whatever, but if you, if you want to go at any speed, you're going to be going on, on the bus. Here is the town loop. It's voluntary. And the first year they operated this service, they had, everybody was riding this service in the park. People, people found it was a very high quality service. They were great headways. It was, it was a good system. And they said it was wonderful. But the park and ride for this, uh, for this system was within the park, which meant that everybody was going through the entrance gate, which is the point of highest congestion for many national parks. So they were missing the opportunity to skip the con congestion, and, it, and they were, were not taking it, and you had empty buses running in town. And they said, what's the problem? We've designed the system. It's a beautiful system. The system in town works pretty much as well as the one in the park. What is the problem? And ultimately, somebody figured out that when you're going to an area, you're sitting there having your blueberry pancakes, and you look at the waitress and say, hey, what's the um, uh, What's the best way to get into the park? Oh, you just drive to the visitor center, you park there, and you, you go on. The second year they operated this, they had, uh, they had training meetings. The National Park Service, I believe, paid for them. And the meetings were for seasonal employees, for all the people in town and in the park. And they said, look, folks, we put in this transit system, and it's a good system. You'll see that it's a good system. What we really want is that when, when people ask you, how do you get into the park, you tell them, oh, just leave your car here, because the, the in-town route will take you into the park. And then you just, tra uh, just change on to the other bus. And that year, the, uh, the whole system went like, like magic. Everything was working beautifully. The congestion reduced. It was just, just a, a wonderful thing. The frontline seasonal workers, these minimum wage, completely insignificant people, shaped whether this system was going to be a success or a failure. Stop orientation. Also Zion. Here you have a bus that is coming along and parked here, and people see this, and it's pointed in this direction, and they know it's going to go in that direction. This bus, it's going to come along, it's going to pull out here, it's pointed in that direction, it's going to go in that direction. And people had a great time with this system, except at the place where they had the greatest amenity, and that is the visitor center. Because the bus is here, here, the bu bus is here from both directions, pull off, come into the circle, dwell here, and then go back. And every time... But the drivers were finding that half their passengers would come onto the bus, even though it was labeled, and say, is this bus going to take me to my hotel? I don't know. Because the, the, the mere orientation design of the system communicated what needed to be said. Route orientation. When Acadia National Park first put its system together, it said, well, gosh, we have all these people who are going to be riding on the hotel route from the hotels to downtown Bar Harbor. And we have our most visited part of the park is, the, uh, is this loop in here. So here's a great idea. Let's go ahead and get them from their hotel 
and go straight on through here. And what they found was that downtown, nobody could figure out whether, the, whether getting onto the same bus was going to take them north out of town or south into the park. And so they ended up saying, we need to stop this. Let's just cut all routes here. All routes terminate here. And the red route will get you to your hotel, regardless. The green route will get you in the park, regardless. And that communication worked. People understood. Intelligent transportation systems. At Acadia, they put in the first ever field operational test for, uh, for this stuff. And this is, again, this is back 2001-ish. And, uh, and this was big stuff. So they have next bus signs. I talked to one stakeholder. I, 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 I had to laugh at it. He, he, uh, he was like, I think it's ridiculous. I think it's just the stupidest thing in the world. They have these blinking lights going on out there, these red lights. If we wanted to put something like that in the park, it would never happen. But it, well, will, will, will it help? Will it be? No, come on. People can read a schedule. When they surveyed, they found 80% of the people who rode the bus did so at least in part because of those, the, the, the real-time information. And 80% of them also said, it saved me time. Real-time information brings so much confidence that you're going to get where you want to go, when you want to go, which is the defining mantra of transit. In impact of congestion mitigation. This is a very simple spatial study that I did with my dissertation. People kept saying, I, I asked people, so is the bus helping with the congestion problem? And I, one person was saying, well, no, geez, I mean, we, have, we, have, we have just the same kind of congestion here. It's just terrible. But the buses are full, right? I mean, everything I'm hearing, the buses are well ridden. Oh, yeah, the buses are full. Well, but you say the congestion not, is not, not helping there. No, it's not helping at all. So I went and I looked at what were the traffic conditions before and after the Island Explorer went through its major uh, expansion. And he was right. He was absolutely right. Here you can see 1.5%, 1.6%, actually congestion increased. But what he didn't know, because he couldn't perceive it without having the bigger picture, is that coming onto the island increased by 18%. You could also come on the island by ferry, but in general, this is, this is an indicator of how much, um, this 18% is an indicator of how much uh, visitor activity had changed, and it increased 18%, and in town, congestion only increased 1.8%. Win. <laughs> that is an, an incredible accomplishment. But without communicating that to the public, they're not going to know it. You have to let them know. Another case, uh, not, not quite as positive, when Denali National Park put its, it said, okay, you're, uh, you're not allowed to drive so, so far into the park. Uh, and they, they, they timed it with the opening of a highway. And it, 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 um, it, it was logical for, for, the, for the resource. They did that, and, uh, and it worked well. And sa things were, the safety record in the park, incredible. The fatality rate of pedestrians outside the park went way up. Because everybody was now walking not in their cars, and they were walking across a major state highway, and they were dying. And so with that information, the, the state DOT lowered the speed limits, and, and that, that helped. But you, that gets into there are externalities, and you need to pay attention to them. So we have talked today about recreational transportation planning. Ultimately, recreational travelers are distracted by the attractions, or at least attracted to the distractions. They are unfamiliar, new folks in town. They are traveling by leisure schedules. Possibly a single, single peak, but you know, a really long one. It could be, by the way, um, Fourth of July fireworks. Good luck. Or if you're in an amusement park that runs uh, fireworks once a week or daily, that time. You have uh, expectations for vacation quality. It can't be, I mean, what level of service do we say should be, should be uh, you accomplished within 20 years? Your 20 year plan, what level of service do you aim for? D, there you go, I'm impressed you did that. So yeah, you actually aim for D, because you cannot, you, you don't even want to live with that much capacity that you have to walk a mile across laterally a road to get there. So we, ha 
We expect that peak periods will not be friendly and happy in metropolitan areas. They have to be friendly and happy if you want the tourists to come. Recreational areas have metropolitan scale traffic congestion. It is out of scale with resources. Oh, I forgot to emphasize to you, so uh, the data are there on the slide, but Springdale, Utah, the town has 600 people and 3.5 million visitors per year. Fund your transportation, fund your police, you're using different funding sources. You, um, uh, modes, mode options, mode characteristics, they all have quirks. You have to build them according to your local resources, uh, as in the resource you're, you're viewing. Heightened consideration for the natural and the cultural. Your planning processes need always, in any situation, need to engage the stakeholders, even more so in these situations because the, the stakeholders take a special interest and they also might be willing to contribute more than you would normally think. Communication, quintessential. Absolutely quintessential, and it is always underestimated and underattended. Questions? Sir? Yeah, so I had uh, the opportunity to go to Yellowstone for the first time in my life over the summer. Uh -huh. um, and I found your point about um, kind of getting in the vacation mentality uh, pretty interesting. I got there and I was unpleasantly surprised with the amount of crowds. Uh -huh. And it, it seemed a lot like Disneyland to me. You know, you have mm -hmm. two big loops like the, the park, you drive to one attraction, you cruise around in the park, spot, park, walk around, take some pictures, get back in the car, drive a couple miles on the road, rinse and repeat all day. So, what do you do long term? I mean, you, your park only has so much capacity, and as you know, the world's not getting less populated, there aren't less tourists every day. So, what do you do as demand increases? Well, Yellowstone's, uh, quote unquote, an easy example. It is, uh, uh, it does have basically figure eight, I, I think, in there. And um, what Yellowstone is known as a wildlife viewing park because, because the roads are around the resource, which means you can have the wildlife inside. You can see them from a lot of different points. Uh, so it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful opportunity. Glacier is, is, is very different because it's, it's kind of linear and the wildlife can easily scoot away from you. Uh, it, when you have so many people and they're all going to start and end at the same place and their objective is to look out the window, that's a little easier a, a, a situation for convincing them to get into a public transit than, say, if, you, if you're at the gorge and you know somebody to the east and you want to go visit them. Um, if you, so uh, we, have, we have what are called pass-through parks and destination parks. A destination park, by golly, you're going to get there, and that is the thing. Your pass-through park, you need your vehicle at the other, other side of it. That one transit is the right answer. Um, if, uh, well, I should say, once again, there's no one single answer. In the Yellowstone area, they do a lot with winter, uh, um, winter road uh, research. They do a lot with intelligent transportation systems. So the, the, that's kind of how they're, how they're attracting, attacking their problems. Changing in the future as you know, more and more people are visiting the park, and you know, it's not a very wide road or anything. You know. No, and actually, the, most of the roads for uh, for National Park Service are uh, you you are not allowed to expand them. It is a historic feature, and therefore the width will be. I'll tell you that I, I uh, that one gets under my craw a little bit at, at Glacier because it's a it's a beautiful historic resource. Where I would bend that historic guideline is in the flat part along Lake McDonald. It, you, you cross along Lake McDonald and then you go up the mountain. In the flat part, um, a lot of people like to bike that. It's beautiful biking. And, and families can bike it. The, the mountains for the, for the professionals. But um, the policy when I was there, I, I don't, know, don't know that it's changed. Um, the policy said that during peak times, you are not allowed to ride a bicycle because this, this road is going to be this width period. We're not going to have a bike lane, and it's too dangerous for you to be on a bike. Therefore, we want you to be in a vehicle that will add to the congestion and safety problems. Uh, but a lot of them are constrained in that way. I would fight that fight if I were still a glacier. Okay. So, uh, I'm Heather. I run a Transportation Management Association for Washington Park, and so this is a little bit maybe of a comment if people are interested um, in sort of in our own backyards. That's where the Rose Garden and the Japanese Garden are in Zoo. We have 3 million visitors a year, uh, a huge congestion and parking problem. 
Uh, so you are really just telling our exact story every single slide to sort of like, yes, 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 we've done that. Um, we are collecting a lot of data. If anybody wants data, we have parking data, shuttle ridership data, traffic data. We have honestly more data than we know exactly what to do with. So anybody in the room if you're interested would love to hook you up with that. Um, we are seeing some benefits with the TMA. We started in 2014. Uh, our first year of data showed we had an 80% driving mode split to the part we're down to 66%. Some of that is transit use. A lot of it is Uber and Lyft. Uh, we went from 0.8% in uh, 2014 to 8.6% in this past year using car share services. Uh, so that's just kind of an interesting thought of how technology is impacting this whole story. Um, and we are certainly, to, to this person's point over here, we're, um, we are aggressively trying to get these programs in place. We have a free shuttle system, 40% increase in ridership from last year to this year. We gave 130,000 rides this past year. It's not enough. Um, the popularity of the park and as attendance, tourism's growing, population's growing. Um, we are struggling to keep up with the demand that's on the park. Um, so I, I don't know exactly what the next steps are for us. Um, certainly pushing transit, pushing the shuttle service will be part of that. Um, but yeah, we're kind of exactly, your, the story that you told is the story we've been living for the past couple years. So if people are interested in learning more sort of about locally what we're doing with such a very small microcosm of a part, happy to connect with anybody. Let me, uh, let me ask the student, uh, the, the question that, that might be in some minds, and do you have employment opportunities for students coming up? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, let's brainstorm. We're so new. Um, so I would love to figure out what that could look like. We have a water bureau project coming up. We're losing 50% of our parking at the north end of the park. Uh, that's when the Japanese garden is having its grand reopening, the centennial of the Rose Garden. It's probably one of the more important times of the park's history. And we're losing a huge circulatory road that our shuttle drives on and 50% of the parking. So yeah, we're in the midst of sort of making this happen. And, and we are funded entirely by parking meter funds. Um, so we have funds to sort of be creative and, and think and we have data. We do intercept surveys, 800 to 1,000 people every summer. So we have the data to start looking at it. So yeah, I'd be very interested. I mean, let's just be creative on, on how to do this. And we're, we're such a little microcosm that we have that opportunity to, to think kind of outside the box. And you would be willing to brainstorm with students for term projects to use the data to? 100% would love to give this data out to folks. I mean, and, and if we need to collect other data, let's figure out what that is and, and let's do it. So yeah. There's another question over here. No? Okay. I disappeared. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was going to ask um, more about, like, for the national parks, um, I went to Crater Lake this summer, and I was also surprised at how many people were there, and also the road the structure. It seemed very dangerous to me. Um, but my question was more in regards to his comment on, do you think we're ever going to, like, limit how many people can in the park eventually with the population growth? So uh, Yosemite hit a point, hit a trigger point. And this, this is another aspect of communication uh, that did not work out well for them. In, so they, they, they realized that most of the people who go to visit Yosemite go to the, the Yosemite Valley. And the, it gets to the point that it's terribly crowded. And at, at that point, they had all the old stinky diesel buses in there, and the, and the air quality was terrible. And they had issues with overuse of the valley. So they developed what they called the um, restricted access plan. And they said, when we hit the point that we have this many cars in, this, in the valley, we're going to say that's, that's, that's the limit. And we're going to close the gates and not, not, until some leave, and we're not going to have anyone going in. And so they, uh, in 1995, they hit that limit. And they said, okay, well, we have a plan. Let's enact the plan. And they said, we will close the gates until, until, uh, until, uh, until we have a few people leave, which was amounted to a few hours. And that meant that people who had traveled, who had spent their vacation time, all their vacation money traveling there, sat for hours in traffic, not sure when or if the park was going to open to them. And that hit the news. And that did not hit the news well. And in fact, they, uh, that happened in 95. When I was doing my interviews with them in 2003, they said, and still every year, the, the, the news stories will come out saying, well, tourism season is coming up. Do you think Yosemite will be open? It happened one time for a couple hours. 
in all of history, but every year they would have people still calling up and saying, if I come, are, is the park going to be closed? <laughs> yes, it, we, we recognize there are limits, and we were talking about this uh, this morning. Do you get to the point where you say, you won't have a good experience if you go in because there are so darn many people, therefore we're not going to let a reservation system or, or metering in some way. That is something that gets talked about in these circles, and uh, with the exception of that, Yosemite is essentially never enacted. That's the nuclear option, it is, uh, and, and it is not at all popular with the public. Is there a point? Yes. Uh, what we do is we work everything we can not to get to that point. Time is to thank Dr. Downey for a great talk. If you have other questions, I'm willing to talk about individually. <laughs>